On this episode, we talk with an advocate in Toronto. The 8th Walk 21 Pedestrian Conference is held in Toronto. A tunnel system supplements the Toronto sidewalk system. We go along on a world record walk attempt. The Manual for Streets gives guidance on the process of street design. We talk with an advocate in Pittsburgh. Finally, we look at pedestrian prohibitions in Pennsylvania. Stay tuned. We're in Toronto talking with Dylan Reed. What was your role with the Toronto Coalition for Active Transportation? I was one of uh, several people who helped to start it uh, last year in 2006. Um, I was one of the uh, pedestrian representatives on the coalition. It's a coalition of cycling and pedestrian groups. Um, we felt that it was time for us to come together um, because we had many interests in common. And 2006 was a crucial election year, municipal election year in Toronto, and we wanted to get uh, active transportation issues on the table in the municipal election. What, what were the issues you were concerned about? Uh, well, some of the crucial issues were um, issues like uh, making sure that um, active transportation was really integrated into city planning. Uh, the City of Toronto is very good at uh, making good policies and not very good at implementing them. So, for example, uh, Toronto's bike lane system had come to almost a halt in 2006. And for pedestrian issues, we were finding that um, although the city had good intentions, uh, projects were being developed that didn't have good pedestrian infrastructure. Um, and uh, for instance, roads were being rebuilt um, without improving the uh, situation for pedestrians. So how did the election go for you folks? Um, well, uh, we sent uh, questionnaires out to most candidates and also to school trustees. Um, we got a lot of responses from candidate, uh, candidates, uh, many of them very positive. And the idea was in a sense to uh, make them make promises that we could then hold them to during the next four, following four years. Um, uh, and we did manage to get um, more attention for cycling and pedestrian issues than had been there in the past, um, which was uh, very positive. And what we've seen since then is in fact that um, there's been a lot of really very rapid movement on both cycling and pedestrian issues. For example, the development of the Toronto Walking Strategy, which Walk 21 conference is uh, related to, um, and uh, much more movement on bike lanes um, than uh, there was in previous years. So what's your current involvement with pedestrian issues in the city? Well, at the moment, I uh, recently became co-chair of the Toronto Pedestrian Com Committee, which is a uh, official advi citizens advisory body to the city of Toronto. And uh, our mandate basically is to um, comment on issues that are pedestrian related um, and give advice to staff and to councillors on pedestrian related issues. Um, uh, and obviously there's pluses and minuses. We do get to talk to staff. Staff come to us with material. Um, but you know, we're within the system and so there's a certain amount of uh, uh, process and procedure that kind of slows us down as well. But I think that it's a good balance. Uh, there's outside groups that put pressure on the city. It's also good to have a group that is part of the city structure and we can send motions to city uh, council, council committees um, and hopefully that they get acted upon. And you, you point out how it's important to have both the outside advocates and sort of the, the formal mm -hmm. ad advisory committee. Um, are, you, are you looking at the, the same issues you were before, or do you find that you're looking at the different issues now, now that you're on the, the, the formal committee? Um, we do actually look at a lot of the same issues, I find. Um, the committee uh, can, um, in some sense, get uh, early viewing of a lot of things if staff decides to bring things to us. And they're generally very pretty good and they will bring pedestrian-related uh, policies to us. Uh, we'll get a sort of uh, early viewing of them as they're in development. Um, and uh, that, that's good. I mean, that's a nice thing. Um, other issues, uh, there may be both inside and outside. Um, uh, they, they may come, we, we may see them at the same time and it will depend on the issue whether it's more effective to have someone uh, advisory committee doing it or to have uh, outside pressure going on. Then the advisory committee, you say you're working with staff, uh, mm -hmm. Just uh, how do you feel, fulfill your role? What are the sort of the nuts and bolts of, of what you do? Well, we meet, we meet once a month. Um, staff will bring uh, to us uh, projects or reports that they're working on that they feel are pedestrian related and where they would like to have a pedestrian point of view. Um, for example, uh, 
uh, last, um, in the previous term, uh, we looked at things like uh, new policies for drive-throughs, for example, where obviously pedestrians have a strong uh, interest. Um, uh, we looked at the redesign of Union Station, uh, the precinct around Union Station, which is one of the most heavily pedestrianized areas, in, or heavily pedestrianized used areas in Toronto. It's not at all pedestrianized, but uh, probably huge pedestrian volumes go through there. So we put input into that. Um, we commented on the new uh, standards for developments in Toronto, uh, where originally they were going to have quite wide roads, um, and they didn't they weren't going to necessarily require sidewalks on them and stuff like that. So we pushed for things like narrower roads, sidewalk requirements. We didn't get all everything we wanted, but we, we did make some changes to that. Um, and so those those came before us and we, we basically commented on it. We can also bring things up if we want to. So uh, citizens will write to the committee and say, you know, there's a problem on my sidewalk or why is there no sidewalk here? Or here's a very distant intersection. Or members of the committee will find issues that they're concerned about um, and we'll bring them forward and then we can actually bring those forward to uh, put them into the, uh, the system for a city council to, or city council committee to consider. And you mentioned uh, the city has a, sort of a, a pedestrian vision. Mm -hmm. uh, what's, what's in that and, and what's it going to take to make it happen? Well, the city, um, the, Toronto was one of the first cities uh, uh, in, in North America to actually develop a pedestrian charter. And this, the uh, um, before my time, the Toronto Pedestrian Committee was instrumental in, in getting that charter uh, to happen. So that was a, that was a huge um, a huge step forward. But in the time after that, what we found was that uh, although the charter was there, that it wasn't really being translated into specific policies. And so now the city is what the city is doing um, is actually developing a walking strategy, which will be much more uh, implementation oriented. Um, and uh, what I think will be needed to make that actually successful is uh, basically constant pressure. Um, it's, it's really a huge step forward, and, oh, and thanks in part to the Walk 21 conference being here, staff, I think, have become much more conscious of pedestrian issues. Um, but the trick will be to maintain that momentum, to make sure that once the city comes up with this great strategy, that it starts to be implemented systematically, and, and we'll have to really keep on them about that. Uh, what we found was Toronto was one of the first North American cities to develop a bike plan, for example, uh, back in the mid-90s, um, but then that bike plan and gradually stopped being implemented and was uh, dropped in the list of priorities. So I think one of the roles of the pedestrian committee and of pedestrian activists will be to make sure that um, that once the first of all that the walking strategy is good and so far it's very promising, um, and secondly that uh, it really continues to be implemented and doesn't kind of get set aside because of budgetary concerns or or simply because of a loss of momentum. We're in Toronto talking with Jim Walker, who's executive director of Walk 21. What is Walk 21? Walk 21 is a movement that we started in about the year 2000, and it's a, it's a group where we've brought together professionals from across all the different disciplines of health and transport and planning uh, to talk about walking. And walking we see as the indicator of livable places, and uh, those that share that understanding, uh, we invite to come and join us at our conferences and uh, share their expertise so that we can learn from each other and make places more livable. So what have you been doing here in Toronto this week? So we've had a whole week of, uh, of talking, as ever, which is what you do at conferences, but a lot of walking as well and uh, meeting a lot of people and trying to actually light some fires and make some changes here on the streets of Toronto. So what, what was the theme of this year's Walk 21 conference? Well, what we wanted to do really was uh, is actually just sort of start to get things moving here. Canada's not a place where uh, they have any national policy around this stuff or federal stuff. Uh, and uh, it's quite fragmented. They do trails really well. They do health, I think, really well in terms of getting people walking for health. But um, from a transport point of view, as you can see behind us, I'm sure that, you know, we're just surrounded by cars and interjunctions that are just absolutely gridlocked with traffic. So what sort of person comes to a conference like this? Who was here this year? Um, well, interestingly, we got some people from communities from across the whole of Canada, and I think that was great. But maybe more than in previous years, we've had a huge media interest as well. So uh, quite a few people who've done quite a lot of reporting, uh, uh, got a lot of people interested in the whole subject. And uh, we've had a few politicians who are sitting there thinking, what's this all about? And, um, and obviously, the, all the techie people who are sitting there saying, what is it that I actually do? You know, if I'm a planner or I'm an engineer, 
you know, what is this stuff and what does it actually mean for me? What's what was the key to the media interest? I mean, why why would TV, radio, newspapers be interested in this? Uh, I think the thing is what we're what we're looking at here in Toronto is they know that this city is being overrun by the car, and as such, they've they've really had they've had enough of of how it is. You know, you you look out here and you see nothing but cars. There's people sitting there waiting on the side of the roads, and um, and and they want they want change. What they're, what they're actually doing is abandoning this city centre and they're moving out into the suburbs. And in the suburbs, they're finding that all they've got is a, is a house to live in and a commute, a, an, an extremely long commute that's taking them an increasing amount of time to come into the places where they have to work. And what we're trying to do really, as much as anything, is, is, is say how that doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to keep moving further and further out in order to make these things work. So what's... Uh Where's next year's conference going to be, and uh, what what kind of preview can you give of what we should expect there? Sure. Well, uh, next year we're uh, delighted to go to Barcelona. I mean, it's one of the most walkable cities in the world for sure. Uh, believe it or not, they actually uh, set up a beach in that city a few years ago for the Olympics. There, there was no beach; it was just like an, a, an old sewer, and uh, so they imported a beach, built it, and it's now one of the most top attractions, of course, right in the middle of the city. They've got absolute stunning architecture. You know, they, they can hardly leave a building alone. They're just so interested in, in making it interesting. And so, you know, street after street after street, they've got places that you want to walk, that you want to discover. There's things, it's just such a rich tapestry of, of, a, of a place. And uh, the place is absolutely alive with people. And uh, any time of the year, the weather's good. Um, and uh, I think we'll have a lot to see and, and a lot to learn, really. We're talking with Al Rizowski with the planning department of the City of Toronto. Where are we? We're in the Tr City of Toronto underground pass system. And just what is that? It's a network that connects uh, pr most of the buildings in downtown Toronto in the financial district. In total, there's over 29 office buildings and it's an evolving system. As we actually get new development, we're, act we're adding uh, new buildings. How did it all get started? Uh, it's actually started by the, the private sector where we had office buildings that wanted to connect to a hotel or a hotel wanting to connect to uh, Union Station and that was the genesis of, of the PASS system. It slowly evolved over the last 40 years so we have a whole variety of things that are connected now everything from grocery stores, daycare, um, cultural institutions, sporting venues, uh, a lot of residential development is now connected in the PASS system. Now, as one goes through the PASS system, what does one see? What's the experience like? Uh, the experience varies. Uh, we have heritage buildings, we have new office buildings. Uh, the route itself tends to be more open, like where we are right now. It's um, a bank tower, so it has very wide corridors, may have a food court. Others, it's more constrained. It's a connection that's underneath the street, and it uh, tends to be narrower. Um, but it does it does vary significantly. Some of it is a two two floor space that actually opens up to an atrium, and some of it tends to be a little bit more more enclosed. What advantages does the the pass system have over just you know making wider sidewalks or something like that? Okay. Well, in Toronto, we we always work first and foremost on creating great streets and the PASS system supplements that. And it's important in a city like Toronto that has very extreme weather, we have very cold winters and very hot, muggy summers. So what we will find in Toronto is that, although some people use it all year round, they're what we call the hardcore PATH users, we do get people that use it when the weather tends to be more extreme and it's another layer or another option for pedestrians in downtown Toronto. So what's, what's the total length of the existing PASS system and and what's the future of it? Well, right now it's uh, 27 kilometers, and uh, people often ask, well, how do you get up to 27 kilometers? There are um, shopping centers, for example. The Eaton Center is a large mall with 300 stores, and has multiple layers, so that's actually, the, the connectivity includes the different uh, floors that are in included in individual uh, buildings. It is expanding. We're anticipating in the next 10 years it'll expand to be over 60 kilometers, so that is a doubling of the system. And um, most of the new buildings, they actually are coming to us. They want to c connect. Uh, they see the benefit in having and promoting 
residential condominiums uh, in the downtown area being having having this direct connection. Office buildings is pretty well a given that they, they want to be connected to the PASS system. It is uh, certainly a high level of convenience for employees to be able to go to uh, restaurants underground, go to other office buildings, conduct business. We're in Toronto talking with Mandy Walker with Green Communities Canada. What is Green Communities Canada? Green Communities Canada is a national nonprofit organization here that uh, looks at environmental solutions to various environmental issues that are facing our communities. Well, uh, one example is that the program in Ontario uh, operates the Active and Safe Routes to School program for the children. What is Active and Safe Routes to School? That is a program designed to get kids walking to school and not being uh, driven. So it's a problem in virtually every modern community today that schools are congested with people dropping their kids off in a car. So it's become the norm that kids are driven to school. And what was going on at 12.30 this afternoon? We were breaking a world record. Now we won't have confirmation of that for several weeks to come yet, but it was a, the world record for the largest simultaneous one kilometer walk. And we had this happening at over 1900 different venues all over Canada. How many people have to walk for you to have broken the record? Well, the present record is held by the state of Western Australia, and that is at just over 100,000. So we're anticipating between 300,000 and 500,000 people walk today. Other than you know the honor of, of having the world's record, uh, why is this important to do this? Okay. It's important for two reasons. The main reason is we're trying to send a message to everyone that what we need, we're calling it a walk evolution, right? A, a revolution of walking. So we're trying to create a culture of walking. And we need this to combat global warming, to combat the obesity problem. And if we can get people out walking when it's just a short distance, that's active transportation, right? When we can get them walking a short distance to work or to school or to play, when it's just a short distance, then we can have a huge impact on these big social issues. What, uh, what sort of impact uh, has today's event had so far? Have you gotten the sort of attention you're hoping for? Yes, we've had some incredible media attention. Uh, we, we know at the local level, local communities have been doing a lot with their media to um, get the word out. And we, we know that that's been hugely successful from the number of press releases that have been issued for local events prior to the event to publicize it, to get people out. And today the response has been phenomenal from across the country. We've had national media, local media, provincial media. The neat thing too is that as of this morning, we did have confirmation that we had every single province and territory involved, so that's all 13. We even had 10 Canadians walking on a cruise ship in international water off the coast of uh, British Columbia. What can you do to follow up on this? You get some good press this week. What happens next week, next month? Right. We are trying to promote the International Charter for Walking, which has been a focus of the conference here, the Walk 21 conference, the International Walk 21 conference. So we've been encouraging communities to adopt that charter to uh, commit to the eight principles that it involves, and that will put pedestrian planning first and help to uh, improve the infrastructure, and which is going to make it better and, and safer for people to go out walking. We're talking with Tim Farrow, who is what the French would call an urbanist. What is an urbanist? An urbanist is something a bit wider than a town planner, a bit wider than an engineer or an urban designer. We're concerned with the, des the design and planning of cities as a whole, a holistic approach, if you like. And recently, you worked as a consultant on a project in London. Uh, who are you working for, and what did you produce? I'm a consultant working with Llewellyn Davis Yang, based in London, with offices elsewhere in the world. Um, we were commissioned, along with a couple of other companies, to produce a new design guidance for streets. Uh, it's called the Manual for Streets. And what, uh, what were street uh, designers or planners using before this came out? What, was, uh, what are you going to be replacing? Before, it was pretty much a question of uh, city traffic engineers pulling a pattern book off the shelf and designing streets according to a set of geometric, geometric principles. 
and the manual streets, which I, I can show <laughs> here, is much more a guide not just of how to do it, but the process that you need to go through. All the many things that have to be considered, because streets are not just conduits for cars or automobiles. They're also places where people can socialize, they can shop, they can recreate, they can meet people. And so there's a social function, there's a place function to streets. So we felt that there was a need to turn the idea of street design on its head, start working with the people who are using them. And of course, we have to accommodate vehicles as well. And so the design guide is really about how to approach the, those different aspects and to get an appropriate balance for each circumstance. So it's not just uh, another book full of geometric diagrams? No, indeed. It's also a lot of photographs. It's a lot of fun to look at. And we've also, there are, there are numbers, there are geometrical things in it, but they're not all in one place. We didn't want to end up with people just using a well-thumbed, loved chapter. We wanted people to see the whole, the whole process from front to back. And once, uh, once people start using, using this book, how's that going to change how, how our towns and cities look? Well, it's, it's a guideline. It's, it's not something which is statutory. So it's, we hope that uh, it will influence people who want to try more innovative designs, to bring more sensitive designs of, of streets, better landscaping, better architecture, better design, better paving materials, uh, in all those sorts of ways to enliven the streets that we have and to build new ones which are a lot better than much of what is done. We want to see an end to the loops and cul-de-sacs, or the loops and lollipops is sometimes called, those layouts which are just really designed for traffic safety and have no social character at all. So we want to bring about a change in the way we build our new streets and also refit the ones that we have. And this was uh, written uh, for the UK. Uh, What's the situation like elsewhere in Europe or, or here in North America for you know, what we're doing and, and how something like this could change it? That's an interesting point. Um, th there's a kind of dreadful truth in the UK that we produce the best guidelines and we so have some of the worst practice. Uh, elsewhere in Europe it tends to be the other way about. They, they have super streets, um, but they tend not to bother with uh, the guidelines. They just seem to do it uh, better in many ways. Um, out here, uh, I think there's a definitely a need for a, you know, a rethink of the way streets are. Um, for example, this, this junction right behind us, it's a four-way stop, which you have many of in the United States, for example, but um, uh, as far as I know, we don't have any in the United Kingdom. So it, it, it's an interesting question. Uh, why are streets the way they are? Why, why do they work? Why do they not work? Do they have to always be the same? No, we can always learn from new things and reinterpretations of old things. So it's, the guideline is really to get people thinking along these lines, to open up the possibilities to new ways of uh, designing streets. We're in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, talking with John Smith. Uh, what organizations are you involved with? I'm with the Allegheny County Transit Council and a member of the Banksville Civic Association, my home neighborhood. And what sort of uh, oh, uh, relationship with pedestrian issues do you have in, in those capacities? Well, I'm growing older and walking more, and, and our neighborhood has an issue with both the pedestrians and the main road through the center of the neighborhood and with the Senior Citizen Center that the uh, developer is uh, preparing to build uh, sort of up by the park. And we're, we're trying to get, uh, uh, trying to make sure that the pedestrians have a good, uh, uh, a good place to walk and an ease to get there and won't get run down while they're walking along the road. What are conditions currently like for pedestrians? They're lousy. They're impossible. The, uh, the, whether it's PennDOT or whether it's the county or whether it's the city, they seem to be worrying all about the automobile and not about the pedestrians. They assume everybody drives everywhere, and if you don't, you're out of luck. Well, what's, uh, what facilities would a pedestrian find on, on one of these roads that you're dealing with? 
Well, on Banksville Road, it's the main road, and there's a, a new Rite Aid drugstore on the corner, and it attracts people, and the bus stop, of course, runs up and down Banksville Road, and the Senior Citizen Center is near to Green, uh, Green Tree Road, near to the Banksville Park, both of which would be magnets for seniors. But, uh, I mean, do you have sidewalks? Do you have, uh, what do no, you have? we have nothing. We have roads, we have an occasional guardrail, we have a curb we can balance on, but we don't have sidewalks. Who would be responsible for, for building sidewalks along and roads in your community? Well, I wish you could answer that question because you go to, go to one uh, government and they say, oh, we don't, you know, you have to see, uh, you go to Pendot and they say, oh, you got to see the city. You go to the city and they say, oh, well, it's a county road and you go to a county and, oh, well, that's a local issue. And nobody's responsible, everybody's responsible and nobody's responsible. Have you, have you seen... Has there been any improvement at all over the years, or what's what's been happening to pedestrians uh, over the decades? Mostly, uh, some of the s citizens themselves individually have gone to PennDOT, and it seems that every every time PennDOT makes a, a so-called improvement, it gets worse. You know, they put up a sign that says "No pedestrian crossing," or they put up a guardrail where the uh, where the uh, bus stop is, and it gets worse. And and you know, we can get a program, we can get a physical obstacle placed on the ground. But we can't get any thought or any, you know, any real thought or any real help to getting the uh, pedestrians around. What, what, what is it that pedestrians uh, in this part of Pennsylvania would really need to, to make things happen? Well, the biggest thing they need, and it seems simple to me, is, you know, they need three feet or five feet next to the road that's level. It can be a sidewalk or you know, uh, a pavement or gra even a grass or a gravel path, just, just somewhere to get off the road and out of the line of fire. And that seems to be very hard to get. You wouldn't think, but it seems to be very hard to get. We're on Pennsylvania Highway 51, a little way south of Pittsburgh. Suppose you just got off the bus at the bus stop behind me, and you wanted to go to work at the Denny's at the far corner of the intersection. Could you do it? Well, two of the legs of this intersection have crosswalks, but the other two don't. After you've gone across one leg and you try to cross that other leg to get to Denny's, you're confronted with a no pedestrian crossing sign. It doesn't matter which way you go. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.